This video is going to review the end of Chapter 6. So as you're getting ready to take the Chapter 6 test, you can go through some problems that we would have covered recently since, since the last few days of the chapter. So our first problem just is talking about finding all zeros. And this is really what we would have worked with in 6.6 .6 and 6.7. The idea that we don't know anything other than the equation. We do know a few things as far as how many zeros to look for based on the degree. And we're going to use our calculator to help us get started. So the first thing you should be able to tell me when you look at something like this is the total number of solutions you're going to have, real, imaginary, repeated, and that would be four because it has a fourth degree. So you will see questions that are that simplistic, just getting the idea that you understand how many answers you will get. We don't know yet if they're going to be real or imaginary or repeated. Second thing you want to be able to do is graph in your calculator so you can get a visual. So I already typed this into my Y1, but what you would do is you go into Y1, type in your entire equation, make sure that you have it accurately typed in or else you'll be seeing a very different picture than what you're supposed to. So you can kind of look through mine, make sure everything that is there, and then hit graph. Uh, you may have to change the way you zoomed it. If the last thing you did maybe had a different window, you might have to zoom six to get back to your basic window. And what you can see here is that this graph is crossing the x-axis twice. What, and neither of them are repeated. What this tells me is that I have two real solutions, and that means that there must also be two imaginary solutions. So that's the next question that I could ask, is talking about the number and type of solutions. We have two real and we have two imaginary. The final piece is to actually find where those zeros are. And this one is nice because you can see definitely some integer answers. It looks like negative 1 and negative 5 are my zeros. So I'm going to start with that, and I'm going to do synthetic division with either negative 1 or negative 5. So I'm going to write my coefficients across the top. I'm going to start with negative 1. So a negative 1, drop down my 1, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. And I should get 0 as my rema remainder if I did it correctly and negative 1 really was a 0. I'm going to go one step further. I'm going to do synthetic again with negative 5. If you want, you actually could stop and try to see if you could factor this a little bit. But I know that negative 5 looks like a pretty good 0. So I'm going to drop down, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. And again, I know I was successful because I got a zero remainder. Now I want to look at the digits that are left and what that means. I have a 1 left and a 9 left here. That means that my final piece is x squared plus 9. And I need to know when that equals 0. So I'm going to solve by subtracting 9. And then I'm going to take the square root of both sides. And here's where my imaginary comes from. I get imaginary solutions of plus or minus 3i. I also had real solutions of negative 1 and negative 5, which I found synthetically. And that matches my picture. I saw two real solutions. I didn't see any more, so I knew with a fourth degree I had to have two imaginary solutions. And I did all of the work to justify both the real ones synthetically and the imaginary ones by just setting it up and solving, setting equal to 0. The next couple questions also come from 6-7, where you're kind of working backwards. Instead of finding the zeros, you're being given the zeros, and you're trying to find the original equation, the original polynomial. So these take a little bit more time, because you're doing a lot of multiplying and a lot of distributing. So I have two different ones. I'd say the first one is a little bit easier. Second one is a little more involved because of the imaginary zero. So starting with the first one, if I have zeros of positive 2 and negative 2, that means that I have an x plus 2 as a factor, and I have an x minus 2 as a factor. If I have a 6i as a 0, what I also know is I also have negative 6i, because we talked about how imaginary solutions come in pairs. They are conjugates. So you do not just have a one imaginary answer. So that tells me that I have x minus 6i and x plus 6i. I'm going to multiply this all together. So first I'm going to start with the x plus 2 and x minus 2, because I can do that pretty quickly in my head. I get x squared minus 4. I'm also going to multiply these together, although you may remember what's going to happen if you get 6i as an answer, so you may be able to skip this step, which is fine. If you can't skip this step, when I FOIL it, I only have to do the first and the last, because the outer and inner will cancel. So I take x times x and get x squared. I take negative 6i and positive 6i and get negative 36i squared. But again, I know that i squared should be replaced with a negative 1, which is going to make that negative 36i squared become a positive 36. So I have x squared minus 4 and x squared plus 36. And a lot of times with one like this, you could skip right to that step. If you look at something and say, well, I know if 6i and negative 6i are answers, I know it's going to be x squared plus 36, because I've done a lot of these. If you can't skip that, then you can take the steps that I just showed you. Final step is I need to multiply this together. I need to do one more foiling. So I'm going to do my first, so I get x to the fourth. My outer is going to be 36x squared. Let's do this off the side. My inner is going to be negative 4x squared, so I'm going to end up with 32x squared. 
And then finally, my last, I need to take 36 times 4, which obviously you can reach for your calculator, or you can work it out by hand. You get negative 144. And that is my original function. Now, sometimes problems can have you adjust it. They may say, well, what if the leading coefficient is a 2? If the leading coefficient is a 2, then I need to multiply all three terms by 2. If the leading coefficient was a 5, I'd multiply all three terms by 5. So you can adjust the leading uh, coefficient co accordingly. The next one is going to take a little more work, and it's because the imaginary piece is a little more complicated. You have more of a complex number here. So I'm going to start with the easy part. If 4 is a 0, then x minus 4 is my factor. If 2 plus i is a solution, then that assumes that 2 minus i is also a solution, the conjugate. So I'm going to write x minus 2 plus i, and then I'm going to write x minus 2 minus i. So it's going to be x minus the, the 0, and then x minus the other 0. I need to distribute the minus signs. So when I do that, when I distribute the minus sign, I'm going to have x minus 2, and then it's going to be a minus i. And I'm going to kind of group the x minus 2 together. And then I'm going to do the same thing over here, distribute the minus sign. I get x minus 2, and I'm going to group that together. And then the minus and the minus i become plus i. Now when I FOIL this together, I am going to just multiply the x minus 2 times the x minus 2. So that is x squared minus 4x plus 4. I don't have to do the outer and inner again because they will cancel. So now I'm going to do the negative i times the positive i. I get negative i squared. That should be replaced with a 1 because, again, i squared is a negative 1. You're doing a minus minus 1. So this should actually be x squared minus 4x plus 5. And then my last step is to do a big distributing. This 5 doesn't want to show up very well. Final step, take the x minus 4 that you had from the beginning that you haven't done anything with it. Distribute both the x and the negative 4 to all the terms in the trinomial. So I end up with, when I distribute the x through, I get x cubed minus 4x squared plus 5x. And then I'm going to distribute the negative 4 through. I get negative 4x squared, positive 16x, and negative 20. Combine like terms, so I'm going to combine these two and these two. My final answer for my polynomial is x cubed minus 8x squared plus 21x minus 20. Now, it is nice with these problems. If you want to check your work, you can always graph your final answer and make sure your picture matches up. What I mean by that is this one right here. When you get this answer, if you want to see if this is making sense, graph that in your calculator. And what you should see is that it crosses the x-axis at 2 and at negative 2. And that's it, because you can't see imaginary solutions on your graph. Same thing with this one down here. If you graph this in your calculator, what you should see is that it crosses the x-axis at 4 but that's it, because the imaginary ones are not something that can be seen. So it gives you that ability to kind of get a visual check of what you did. I've got one problem left. This was the very last thing that we did in Chapter 6. It was from Section 6.9, and was when we were looking at a table of data and trying to figure out what kind of regression model should we use. We've done linear regression, we've done quadratic regression, and we now know that we can go cubic or even quartic regression. The way we do this was called a finite differences, was the name of the technique. What you're doing is you're finding the difference between your y values, and you do that until you get your difference to be the same across the board. So just reminding you what we did in class. You're going to take 0, minus, minus 5, and get 5. That's saying there's a difference of 5 between those two values. Then I'm going to do the same thing here. 9 minus 0 is 9. 16 minus 9 is 7. 15 minus 16 is negative 1. And 0 minus 15 is negative 15. I don't get all the same number, so that tells me it's not a linear regression. So I go again. 9 minus 5 is 4. 7 minus 9 is negative 2. Negative 1 minus 7 is negative 8. Negative 15 minus minus 1 is negative 14. Still not the same number, so I'm going to go through again. Negative 2 minus 4 is negative 6. Negative 8 minus minus 2 is negative 6. Negative 14 minus minus 8 is negative 6. So I do get the exact same number. It took me 1, 2, three finite different pattern to get that. That tells me that this is a cubic model. So that's the first part of this problem, is just identifying which model is accurate. That's done. The second part of the problem is now actually putting it in and getting that cubic regression model. So that comes from going to your calculator, going to Stat, Edit, 
you're going to enter your data in. Now, the nice thing is this is the one we did in class as far as the L1 is already the same. We do have to change the L2s to give us those values. So I'm going to type in all of my data. Make sure it's accurate. Go to Stat and Calculate. You're looking for the cubic regression, which is the sixth one down there. You will have to enter multiple times. And the calculator will tell you exactly what your coefficients are. So this cubic has, uh, for a leading coefficient of negative 1, so you have y equals negative 1 x cubed. I'll look back to my calculator. I have all of it. Plus 8x squared plus 12x. Or was it minus? Minus 12x. There was no constant term, so this is your final answer for your model, and this problem's done. So it takes you through what you kind of see is some problems from 6-7, and then this last problem from 6-9 to get a little bit of extra practice from what we did at the end of the chapter as opposed to what we did in the beginning.